Oh, so good morning, everyone. And my name is Suho, and I'm a master's student at Dong University, South Korea. And I am a little bit nervous about like I'm the only student here, I guess, and everyone's like from Google, Intel, IBM, Red Hat. And I was expecting like half of these people were going to be here, and a bit nervous a lot. So. Anyway, so I'm today I'm going to talk about Tux, a trust update on Linux kernel, uh, which is a research about maintaining integrity of a system along with the frequent kernel updates. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of uh, related works and attack models, and then I'll explain Tux and show some prototype experiments, and finally, and I'll conclude my talk and I'll take questions at the end. To begin with, uh, security vulnerabilities are prevalent and we see thousands of new CVEs every day. And for example, recent announcement of the Meltdown Inspector has been causing a lot of troubles in the Linux society as well. And I saw Linux distros have been deploying a lot of security updates to countermeasure or at least mitigate such vulnerabilities. However, uh, I, in my opinion, there was not much attention given to the changing integrity after those updates and ways to manage the updated integrity informations. So there are two concepts. First of all, the maintaining integrity and the other side, the security updates. And in my point of view, the maintaining integrity is trying to keep the system as it is and run the system as it is. And on the other side, the security updates tries to secure the system by modifying the system. And therefore, uh, I guess the, after the updates, the info, uh, in integrity information is inevitably changed and there's a need for matching them. And we came up with these two questions. First of all, the, can modern integrity management solutions distinguish between uh, managers' modifications and intended updates? And if it does, is the modified integrity being properly managed? To answer these questions, we have investigated some of the modern integrity management technologies. First of all, the Intel TXT, which employs GRUB module TBoot and the launch control policy, aka LCP, to measure slash verify boot the Linux environment. However, when it comes to the update, uh, the LCP can be a little bit of drag. Uh, this is because the LCP can only represent uh, only one state of a specific state of a machine. So therefore, the LCP must be also updated according to the updates. And also, TXD does not measure or verify GRUB commands, which can allow an attacker to modify the GRUB commands to boot into a malicious kernel or um, load a malicious GRUB module. Uh, next of all, the OpenCIT is a remote authentication solution created by Intel also to validate the TPM measurement from the remote server. The OpenCIT server establishes the known good values by importing the TPM measurements from the local systems and perform the remote attestation using those value as a, a root of trust, I guess. Uh, however, the problem with OpenCIT is that the local updates are not transparent to the OpenCIT server. Uh, which means that when the local system is updated, the uh, remote attestation fails until it reestablishes the whitelist by importing, re-importing the updated measurements. Finally, the UEFI secure boot uh, is an uh, integrity verification function defined the UEFI BIOS. It verifies the signature of an executed binaries using the public keys stored in the firmware database. Uh, we found that good thing about the UFI secure boot is that it enables simple updates since it only needs to sign the updated binaries and deploy the binaries. And the receivers only need to receive the binaries and install them. Unfortunately, uh, we, found, we find it difficult to say that UFI secure boot is uh, suitable for Linux environment since it does not uh, support grub bootloader unless they install a private key, the uh, private, uh, public key of the installer. The, and on the other side, the Microsoft provide a public key stored in the firmware of the uh, main boards. 
Anyways, the, the another problem of the UFI Secure Boot was that it does not support GRUB, uh, so consequently it does not support verifying GRUB commands, which leads to the same problem of the Intel TXT. Additionally, it does not support TPM measurements. So let's now take a look at how these problems can be troublesome. So first of all, we can subvert the OpenCIT scam scheme all the way through. Uh, this occurs because the local updates are not transparent to the OpenCIT. So let's assume that the attacker can update the local machine and perform measure boot. So as a first step, the attacker tries to uh, succeed to update the local machine with the MySQL kernel and boot up the MySQL measurement. And TPM will measure the MySQL kernel, creating the MySQL measurement. And then the OpenCIT, who has no idea about the local updates, it will try to perform the remote attestation and eventually fails. And then, as the local system has been updated, it tries to re-import the measurements, which is now gone malicious, and try to create the new whitelist. And now the whitelist becomes um, compromised, and after this point, the attacker may run the malicious kernel, even though the uh, OpenCIT confirms that the local system is trusted. Next, we can circumvent verify full scams. First of all, the TXT can be fooled with a, a hypervisor rootkit introduced at, uh, this was introduced at Black Hat USA 2016, and I don't know if you guys have fixed it or not, but it can be an example. And also, earlier this year, uh, uh, at, also at the Black Hat Asia 2018, uh, one of the team demonstrated uh, how to subvert the TXT scam uh, and I think it was called, I don't want to sleep tonight, I guess. And if, anyways, they, with the US, uh, Black Hat USA 2016, uh, the hypervisor rootkit, they executed the rootkit, a uh, hypervisor rootkit that mimics TPM uh, through the grub commands and before they load the tboot module. So, and they tried to circumvent TXT and they succeeded by running the measures kernel, even though the tboot uh, verifies that the local machine is trusted. Also, the secure boot does not verify integrity after the grub bootloader is executed. Therefore, the attacker can modify grub commands to launch MySQL kernel or load other grub, uh, grub modules. And we believe that these two attacks are caused uh, because the TXT and secure boot does not verify executed grub commands during the booting. So, to provide proper integrity management along with the updates, we stated some goals. First, the remote attestation must transparently manage local updates to distinguish updates, intended updates from the malicious modification. Second, the remote attestation must maintain whitelist according to the conducted updates and perform remote attestation using up-to-date whitelist values. And finally, the local machines should perform thorough slash uh, measure slash verify booting, including the grub. And so we propose Tux, a trust update on Linux kernel. Uh, Tux code is uploaded to my GitHub. There's a link below. And Tux paper will be presented at STM 2018, so which will be held next week at Barcelona. And if you guys want to check more information, just check the paper, I guess. And before I explain Tux, uh, look, uh, I'm going to explain some of the key technologies I used in Tux. Uh, first of all, we use the famous TPM 2.0 to measure integrity. It is a tamper-proof device to measure integrity and store the integrity measurements. Uh, fun thing about the TPM is stores the integrity measurements to the special registers called the PCRs. And uh, some of you might know the PCR values are not just created, the calculated values, and just stored into the PCRs. It uses a special operand operation called extend. 
the extended operation generates new PCR value by first concatenating the hash of the data and the uh, old PCR value. And TPM ha uh, hashes the whole concatenated value again to create the new PCR value, which will eventually uh, create a trust chain for the values measured in that PCR, specific PCR number. And next, we use shim and grub bootloader to maximize Linux compatibility with the UFI secure boot. Uh, shim is a first stage bootloader to, for Linux to support UFI secure boot. And good thing about the shim is that it can be used to uh, verify executed binaries from the grub uh, by using the shimlock verification function. Uh, shimlock protocols are basically a protocols that allows a grub, uh, grub bootloader to communicate with the shim bootloader. And the fun thing about the shimlock verification is that it uses the, also the firmware database uh, keys uh, stored in the uh, public keys stored in the firmware database, uh, just like the UFI secure boot. And we use them to verify uh, signatures of our executed binaries. And also we use a modified grub from core OS branch uh, since it well supported TPM2 and TPM2 uh, integrity measurements. Uh, as a research, there are a few assumptions that we made. And first of all, we assume that the Tux server is the uh, OpenCIT server and the maintainer slash administrator of the updates. Uh, this makes Talks transparently manage the local updates. And second of all, we assume that the Tux only verifies the interior to Linux booting process. Um, this is because that uh, Linux, uh, we think that the kernel should be verified during the booting process. And after the boot, there are plenty of uh, powerful solutions to secure the system. And thirdly, we assume that the Tux server is trusted and safe. So we believe that it is not compromised. And fourthly, we assume that the Tux owner holds the manifest of a specific booting process of each managed machines. And finally, we assume that all managed machines should hold Tux owner's public key in the firmware database. So, this is the full architecture of Tux, which is, consists of three, uh, three main components. First of all, the integrity manager, uh, which manages integrity according to the updates, as well as it is in charge of up, uh, deploying the updated kernels to the local systems. And PCI assign kernel, uh, is it is a special kernel for integrity verification. And finally, the TS boot, which provides a robust uh, measure slash verify booting at the local machine. So first of all, the integrity manager is a component that resides in the OpenCIT server. It is in charge of integrity management and also the kernel updates. And it has three little modules. First, the module is trusted repository, which holds the val valid binaries for the updates, uh, which is just a eventually um, at get repository for the trusted kernels. And the wireless updater, which generates and updates the known group values according to the updates. And lastly, the PCI assigned kernel generator to generate PCRs and deploy the kernels to the local servers, uh, systems, I mean. I'll explain more about the PCI assigned kernel on the later slides. So, with the integrity manager, the Tux uh, kernel update and remote attestation procedure will be looking like this. First of all, the local machine's kernel update repository is set to the Tux server, and it will allow Tux server to notify updates to the local machines. And when we get denotified, uh, it will request the update to the Tux server. And if the Tux server gets the notif uh, re request, update request, it will calculate and update the new wireless values according to the requested updates. And it will also generate PCI assigned kernel and deploy the kernel, trusted kernel to the local machines. It will install them and finally, the OpenCIT server will remote perform remote attestation to check if the updates has been properly installed. 
with the Integrity Manager, Tux achieved the first two goals, managing local updates transparently since the update administrator is the Tux itself. And the second goal, the successful remote attestation with the up-to-date wireless value. And on the side, I don't know if you guys can see it properly, uh, there's a comparison between the OpenCIT and Tux when there is a kernel update and it tries to perform the remote attestation. The second component of the Tux is PCI sign kernel. It is basically a trusted kernel with, which is used during the TS boost interactive verification. And PCI sign kernel is a kernel that is signed with the tPCR value instead of the digest hash. So the idea of the, the initial idea of the PCI sign kernel was that if the tPM generates hash uh, and the most of the digital signatures uh, keep the hash data, digest hash inside the kernel. Uh, why don't we switch them? Use the PCL values as the hash of the you know, binaries that we use. So the tPCR is a calculated known good value, which is created by the integrity manager inside the OpenCIT. And by extending the, uh, it is a value that represents the booting process without any broken integrity, and this is possible because we assume that the Tux server knows the whole entire booting process of the local machines, and they can generate PCL values, the expected PCL values according to those information. And I'll explain how the PCL sign kernel is used for the interactive verification in the next section. The last component of Tux is TS boot aka trusted, trusted Secure Boot. It is a combination of UFI Secure Boot, Modified Shim, and Modified Grub. It is Linux friendly by using the existing Linux bootloaders, and it measures every binaries and commands executed during the booting process, including the Grub commands and the Grub modules. And with TS Boot, we propose a robust interactive verification scheme called PCI verification. So the PCI verification verifies the entire booting process during the booting. It tries to measure the entire booting process to uh, PCI number 12 and to create a measurement that represents the entire booting process. And since we measure everything to the PCI 12 from basically the hardware measurements to the kernel booting processor uh, commands, uh, if anything changes regarding the booting, it will reflect to the PCL12, and when the kernel is executed using the Linux EFI function uh, de uh, defined in the grub, uh, grub bootloader, uh, it will pass the kernel to the shim and using the shim lock verification function for the verification. And shim decrypts the tPCR value inside the kernel signature and compares it with the PCR12, which, will, which must have the same value as the tPCR if it has booted successfully without broken integrity. Uh, with PCR verification, this gives a full control of booting to the Tux owner, and the local machines must boot in, uh, in the same order that Tux owner uh, defined previously. And if anything changes during the booting for the uh, booting, it will halt the booting and since the PCL12 measurement will be changed and this will provide a robust integrity. With the TS boot, we achieved the third goal, the robust measure slash verify booting, including the grub commands. Uh, I have shown the comparison between the Intel TXT and Tux over there. Uh, Intel TXT basically tries to measure each steps of the booting process and go through all those steps to verify the booting. And Tux tries to verify the system only by comparing the PCL12 before the execution of Tux, uh, the kernel itself. So that's kind of a difference. And as a proof of concept, we have performed few experiments. First, we experimented if the Tux can detect any modification during the booting using the PCI-12. 
any modifications, I mean uh, hardware modifications, firmware mod option modifications, and software modification using, used during the booting process. Uh, we have four cases to prove them. First, the case A with PC1, with kernel version 1, and secure boot on. Uh, case B, PC1, with kernel version 2, and secure boot 1, which represents a software change. And case C, uh, PC1, with kernel version 2, and secure boot off, which will represent a firmware option change. And finally, the case D, PC2 with kernel version 2 secure put on, which will represent the hardware change. And we have confirmed that the PCL12 on the last line has changed under all circumstances. Uh, and it shows all that if anything changes, it will rep uh, reflect it to the PCL12. The other PCL values ha also have other meanings that the PCI according to the PCI numbers, uh, PCI 0 to 7 are measured throughout the uh, secure boot process, and PCI 8 and 9 will be measured by the trusted group, and PCI 10 and 11 will be measured by SHIM bootloader for the group and kernel entity, and of course the PCI 12 will be extended throughout all the process of booting to represent the entire booting process. Second experiment was to check the PCR verification, if the chip PCR verification can detect GROC commands modification. Uh, I have added an extra command that echoes this is, fail, this is to fail PCR verification, and eventually when booting, the PCR uh, 12 changed, and we can successfully detect and halt the booting itself. Finally, we have experimented if the OpenCIT can perform thorough remote attestation using the new wireless values when we update them. And here we have only used the PCI 12 value as a whitelist for simplicity. And we saw Talk successfully performs thorough uh, remote attestation with update wireless value. Here we can see the green check sign on the uh, last picture. And I'll show a short demo of Tux for the system. Sorry. So initially, we initialized the kernel version 62 and registered to the OpenCIT server. So we performed the, when we performed the remote attestation, uh, it will state the machine as trusted, showing the grub, uh, green check sign. And after that, we perform a normal uh, local update without notifying the OpenCIT server. Uh, this will cause uh, uh, remote authentication failure because the OpenCIT server has uh, outdated uh, whitelist values. And then we restore the machine to kernel 62. After that, we try to update with Tux, and it will also update the val whitelist values inside the OpenCIT, and the local system will request the updates to the uh, OpenCIT server. And when the update is complete, uh, when we perform the remote attestation, it will show the green check sign again. And when we check the whitelist values inside the OpenCIT database, we can see that it is successfully updated and it matches with the measure, new measurements uh, from the booting itself. And we also support rollback if the kernel version we request uh, is inside the trusted repository. We can request, here we, I, re I requested uh, kernel version 62 again to notify the uh, OpenCIT server. I want to change my kernel version to the previous one. And now the kernel version is updated. And the local the OpenCIT server is notified with the updated whitelist values. And it can support um, proper remote attestation. After this, uh, there's a short demo of PCR verification halting the booting when GROC command is changed during the uh, booting process itself. So when we boot, uh, I visit the GROC commands and I entered fault echo. 
changing the growth command, executed growth commands, and it successfully holds the booting and stops booting itself. So as shown in the demo, kernel uh, rollback is supported if requested kernel version is still exists in the trusted repository. And also TOS can detect rollback attacks since TOS cannot perform whitelist updates uh, with the kernel that it doesn't exist in the trusted repository. So if it is outdated kernel version, uh, the whitelist values cannot be updated according to the version. And if it checks the kernel version, the measurement doesn't match, it will stop, it will uh, state the machine is untrusted and it is somehow uh, mod uh, modified or compromised. And we believe that the both public key and the private key of Tux owner's key is safe since we assume that the OpenCIT server, which stores the private key, and the firmware database, which stores the public key, is safe. And we believe that Tux may be applicable to other environments who uses UEFI Secure Boot, TPM, and Shim and Grub Bootloader, which, which I believe that it is uh, mostly applicable to other Linux systems, including Red Hat, Ubuntu, and other stuff. And it can be also uh, uh, applicable to small systems other than the desktops, maybe IoT devices. And finally, after the TXT, uh, most people are, tend to use more DRTM, but Tox seems like a SRTM. However, I think that Tox dynamically generates the whitelist and PCR sign kernel according to the GROC command, so I think Tox is in between the SRTM and the DRTM. So to conclude, the integrity changes when the update is conducted, and thus it should be properly managed. And Tox successfully supports integrity management along with the frequent kernel updates by first by in extending the OpenCIT server to transparently manage the local updates and remote attestation with up-to-date wireless value. Thirdly, the thorough integrity measurement, including the GRUB commands and the GRUB modules using the TS boot. And finally, it provides robust integrity verification with PCR verification. So that's it, and I'll gladly take some questions and feedbacks. I uh, really enjoyed uh, enjoyed that. It's really interesting integrating that with OpenCIT. Two comments. Uh, first thing is we ended up writing our own uh, secure bootloader uh, because we wanted both D uh, SRTM and DRTM, and Grub doesn't support both at the same time because you can either have multi-boot or uh, secure boot through the UEFI. Uh, the other thing is you're overriding PCR 10, and by default a lot of distribution kernels uh, already have IMA configured on PCR 10, so it'd be good if you didn't clobber that by, by default. All right, um, thank you for the comment. Yeah, it, it, it seems like you're, you're, you're making the assumption that on OpenCIT there's no authorization required to update the, the new server, for, for example. Is that, uh, it, it doesn't automatically update it, um, as you're claiming, someone's gotta be on the back end authorizing the new set of PCR values that are now uh, that are now valid or don't update the PCR values because I don't trust this new one. Uh, so basically, uh, when we try to use the OpenCIT to verify the TPM measurements from the locals, uh, we saw that the, when the local system is updated, the local user must re-import the TPM measurement as a whitelist by himself by going into the web and importing the new values to the OpenCIT database. Uh, okay, go, 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 which requires authorization. Which, yes. Which requires authorization yeah. from the administrator. Yes, so you sure. need to uh, type in ID and password to get into the uh, screen, the website, right. uh, which, which is provided by the OpenCIT. But 
we are assuming that the attacker may have those uh, password and IDs. And oh, so the, yeah. So it yeah. can like update the whitelist itself. Well, so yeah, if the if yeah if the attacker yeah. owns the back end, if that happens, the, that username yeah. password to all the firewalls, all the servers, they can get it <laughs> all of them too, right? I'm not sure. I I don't think that's a valid assumption. Yes. Based on based on what, uh, what I think, there's a lot of things. I, so I can't speak for Intel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a lot of things, agreed, there's a lot of things wrong. Mm -hmm. My opinion is go fix the stuff that's there. Don't create a whole new, whole, entirely new framework. You know, that's. I see. Thank my you. My other comments are too long for the time we have. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> I think that's it, right? <laughs>